and a uh, little uh, James David was uh, born uh, yesterday, let's see, let me get where I'm at here, Sunday, Saturday, Friday, it was Friday evening, James David was born, evening, I don't remember when he was born, I really don't, I don't remember when he was born, he was born in the past three days, I know that, and uh, they induced uh, late Thursday, actually Friday morning about midnight, and things weren't progressing as they expected them to. It was in the afternoon Friday he was born. Yay. All right. Yeah. Uh, he's a little guy. Reminds me a lot of Justin when he was born. Just kind of skinny as a rail. Uh, 19 inches long. Uh, 5 pounds, 13 ounces. Just a wee little guy. And, uh, but he was hungry. And uh, it said they cr he cried for about a half hour uh, after he was born. And so I uh, appreciate your prayers and uh, appreciate uh, being back and being with you today. We're going to get right into the study. So uh, happy Mother's Day to you mothers. We'll be acknowledging the mothers in the morning service. We'll be giving out uh, roses. We do that every year, some kind of a token of appreciation. Uh, the roses this year were sparse. I'm telling you, I don't know what happened, but the roses, they did not look pretty. Have anybody noticed that? They didn't look real pretty. I bought some for my wife. Does anybody know... If roses, if if um, if if um, distilled water is bad for plants, anybody know that or not? Should be fine. They're not. I don't know what happened. I mean, maybe I had some chemicals in the vase before I put that in. I don't know, but uh, it's terrible when you buy some roses and all of a sudden they're going like that within just a couple of hours, you know. And so I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, I'm glad I have a wife who said, "Well, it's the thought that counts." How many of you guys say, praise God, if it wasn't for the thoughts that count, I'd be in trouble? <laughs> Amen? Amen. All right. Get your Bibles. Go to the book of Daniel, would you please? And uh, you're, you were probably expecting Brother Williams today, and you rightfully so to expect him, but he's not going to be here. He called me today and said, um, or called me this last week. I want to say Thursday he called me right before we went out of town, and he said, Brother, he said, can't be there. Or no, he, what he said was this. He said, Brother, he said, my wife and I have just tested positive for COVID. And he said, uh, what sayest thou? And uh, my first thought was, glad it's you and not me. That was, what, that was the first thing I thought. No, it wasn't the first thing I thought. And uh, I love Brother Williams. He and his wife, just, just really super sweet people. But I said, you know what? As far as I'm concerned, I'm healthy. I've had it. Uh, I got the immunities. I said, but I'm speaking for a whole church right now. And I said, we have elderly and young and, and uh, you know, compromised. I said, probably just don't need to come out. He said, no problem. And so... Uh, then he texted me the next day. He said, man, he said, uh, actually, I texted him and said, how you doing? He said, I've been down for 14 hours straight sleeping. He said, just feel really, really rough, feel a little bit better after the 14 hours. So it must have hit him pretty hard. I said, haven't you had it before? He said, had it twice. And uh, he said, but this is the first time they got tested, so who knows what they had, right? So anyway, uh, that disappointed me, and I told him, I said, man, if there was any way we could reschedule, I said, I hate to miss you when you're over here in the States. And so it worked out that uh, July 17th, they have that all day. And they'll be passing from New York, heading out to Iowa. So they're going to be here on that day. And uh, so anyway, that day, no matter what, we're gonna, well, I can't say that. I can't say that. But uh, anyway, I'm glad we were able to, to uh, reconnect and be able to set up something. Pray for, uh, good to have the, the nose with us again. It wasn't really a planned thing. They're here by... Um, they're here, how do I say it, reluctantly? Amen. Just like some people come to church on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. No, they're, they're here reluctantly. Uh, his uh, his uh, ram, his, his truck that he pulls a fifth wheel with, uh, <clears throat> that had a problem. They found out the problem. It's going to require a certain level of overhaul of the engine and uh, pray because that's not going to be a cheap thing. So he can't go anywhere until they get that taken care of. If it goes longer than two weeks, we're just going to make them members. <laughs> All right. So anyway, do, do pray for it. Pray the Lord's good with him as far as with uh, what is wrong with that. I'm glad there's not one thing in our life that our God uh, doesn't take an interest in, aren't you? No matter how big or small, I'm glad that he's interested in the smallest of things. Book of Daniel, that's where we left off last week. And so uh, since uh, Brother Williams isn't here, we're going to continue on with it. We left off... Uh, we hit the uh, Medes and the Persians. Of course, that was chapter 6. 
uh, I'm sorry, no, no, that was, uh, that was the uh, handwriting on the wall. You remember that? And of course, the handwriting... No, we got the Medes and Persians. Chapter 6, that's when Daniel goes to the lion's den. I talked about that for a little while. Chapter 7 through 12 of Daniel. Chapter 7, if you go there through 12 of Daniel, uh, that is dealing with last day's prophecy. Now, you'll take a look in chapter 7. Every commentator that I know when they go to chapter 7, you have four beasts. They take the four beasts and they put them up directly with, if you would, the, um, the uh, four, remember the image, and there were four in the image, the head and the chest and the loins, the legs, and so on, all the way down. I guess five, you want to count the toes or whatever, all right? So what they do is they put that together and say, well, this is just another repeat of the image. You got four, uh, you know, four kingdoms that are spoken of dealing with, with, um, uh, with animals or with creatures. And that's not right. That's not right. This is not just a repeat of the image. I'll show you why. Look in chapter 7, verse 1. Then the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream uh, and vision of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote uh, the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Uh, now, just once again, comparing Scripture with Scripture, over in Revelation, is the many waters the Bible speaks of. A beast came out of many waters. But over there it says this, the waters thou sawest are nations, tongues, and people. And so we get a definition of what the waters are. Uh, in the Bible, life, this world, is spoken of like a sea. You're navigating. There's storms and, the, and, and so on. You get that. So he saw the four great beasts come up uh, from the sea, one diverse, one from another. Four, uh, first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of uh, mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they uh, they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. Uh, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this, I saw in the night vision. Uh, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had a great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts uh, that were with it. Uh, and it had ten horns. All right. Now that beast, verse 7, sounds very much like the beast of Revelation 13. Ten horns sounds like the ten uh, kings over Revelation 17 with the great whore. You remember that, all right? You say, why isn't this just a repeat? Uh, and that's what they do. They give the repeat of it. Thus, verse 7, you remember over in the image uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it was Babylon, you're this head, Nebuchadnezzar. And then after you, there's going to be a lesser empire, Medes and the Persians. And then after you is going to be another empire. It's going to spread to the whole world. That's Alexander the Great. And then a kingdom after that, where, uh, rule with iron, that would be Rome. Of course, Rome had a division. There was the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, to, to describe the legs and the split and so on. And so what they do is they say, chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 7, is uh, Rome. That's not right. Once again, they're taking it and they're applying it to this image. Why isn't that the case? I'll show you. Chapter 7, verse 1, this shows you why we have to so watch what we're reading. He says, in the first year of who? So Belshazzar is the king, we know in Daniel, when the Medes and the Persians overthrow it, correct? We know that, all right? So Babylon is existing right now. This is shown to Daniel during the kingdom of Babylon. Would we agree? Go over, if you would, now. Go, um, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, verse 17. He's explaining the, to what this is to Daniel. It says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, read the next two words, which shall arise out of the earth. That absolutely states that those four cannot be the four in the previous. All right, And what it looks like to me is, 
Uh, you could try to make, I, I, some make the lion in verse 4 of Persia, uh, some make uh, uh, Greece to be the um, bear, and Rome to be the six. In other words, kind of just shifted it a little bit is what they do. That may be, and it may be that the lion deals with more of a current uh, kingdom, and the bear, if the bear referred to a current kingdom, I'd have to believe, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe that's dealing with Russia. Who knows? I mean, arise and devour. Uh, we thought we were done with that when they invaded Crimea. And all of a sudden, we're not done with it. Where do you think he's going to stop? He's not going to stop until he gets the USSR back together. That's his goal. That's his desire, is to revive the glory. You know, that's the amazing thing with man. Man gets glory, loses glory, then tries to reclaim the glory he lost. That's exactly what mankind's doing. God created man in a glorious state fashioned unto God himself, in the image of God, right? You know what man's been trying to do? Get the glory of Eden and that, that, that created creation. He's trying to, that's all he's been trying to do for 6,000 years. That's it. That's man's, and the problem is they try to get it back without God. The gospel is, in the big nutshell, if you would, is God's going to reclaim everything Adam lost. Now, he's doing it through Jesus Christ, but he's going to reclaim it. And what mankind's doing today, well, the same thing with Hitler. Hitler was trying to reclaim the glory it had before World War I. And after World War I, they were just, uh, uh, they were, I don't want to say oppressed, that wouldn't be a right word, but they were subdued by the nations and he resented it. And so his desire, the Third Reich, his desire was is to reestablish the glory Germany had. Why do you think all the Germans went along with it? It would be akin to make America great again. And listen, I'm all for making America great again, but I just don't know how far back you have to go before you find great. Amen, amen. Hey, on that note, you've listened to what's going on in the Supreme Court, right? And you got to say thank God on a moral level, yes, amen. But uh, I'll just throw something out to you. I just don't trust anything coming out of Washington or the news media. I really don't. And I don't know, I don't know the Democrats didn't get their, their crony in the Supreme Court. You didn't know they had a crony there. He's, he's a Supreme Court justice. They own him. They own him. And I don't know if they can get him to say, push this to the forefront and uh, let's get this through. Be Why? Because they're dividing again. Do you realize if nothing happens right now, the Democrats have nothing to hang their hat on? They have nothing to rally for in November? Nothing. Boy, this look, I'm all for it passing. I'm just telling you, don't be surprised if it becomes a two-edged sword because it's being used by the same wicked people that put it there in the first place. And once they get back in, they'll just throw it right back in. They'll overthrow it. Why? Because they have their crony in the Supreme Court. And yes, that goes across. It might get knocked off. I don't know. I don't care. Still true. Do you remember when, uh, when Roberts, uh, when, when Obamacare, when, and the big issue when Obamacare was around, they were saying, uh, it's not a tax. It's not, not a tax because they didn't want the political ramifications of it being a tax. But if it wasn't a tax, it was illegal. It was unconstitutional. So it goes to, uh, to um, uh, Roberts, it goes to the Supreme Court as not a tax. Everybody's saying it's going to get knocked down because it's unconstitutional. And Roberts says, well, everybody can see that technically this is a tax. And thus it's legal. And they passed it. You know what that's called? It's called legislating from the bench. He changed it. He did not rule on it the way it came to him. You say, why? Because someone's got him in their hip pocket. That is the rule of politics today. Amen, amen. And I'll tell you who I think, whoever it is, whoever it is that's running that Epstein thing, they've got John Roberts in their hip pocket. Amen. He was shown, he was shown swimming at the perverse island. They took the basis of people and made them priests. That's our problem today. Honestly, I think, uh, you know, the election just took place. I'll, I'll, I'll get away from it. The election just took place. There's biblical Bible for it. That's what we've done. We've taken the basis of people and we've made them rulers over us. And the whole crowd needs to be ran out on a rail. The whole group. And so you had that Blystone that was running for, uh, for uh, governor. And there was something that was a trade. You say, why? He was a farmer. I told my wife here quite some time, I said, what has, needs to happen is we need to replace all the politicians with farmers and plumbers and electricians and people. That's what it was made up of in the founding of this country. Amen.
Okay, enough of that. I'm off my bully pulpit now, all right? So uh, you say, well, who is this? I think it, the three could be three kingdoms, whether where they show up, they could three, three kingdoms that precede the beast of Revelation. Now, you know, once again, uh, some take that leopard of chapter, or verse uh, 6. They try to make that the USA, and that may be the case. I don't know. But this is very heavily prophetical. Now, I want you to go to chapter 8. Chapter 8. In chapter 8, you have a... Now, once again, I've repeated a thousand times, what God does is He gives you history, and He says, now, in this history, you're going to see the future. It's the way it was back then. That's what's going to happen, right? In this case, what you're going to find, I'll, I'll give it off to you, but look in chapter 8. I'll explain it to you in a second. Look in verse um, 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and, and I, uh, I was by the river of uh, Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and two horns were high, uh, but one was higher than the other. And the, uh, and the higher came up last. I saw the, the ram pushed westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between its eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen stand, standing before the river, and ran into him with fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped uh, upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. All right. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken." Uh, and for it came uh, up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came for, uh, forth a little horn. Now the little horn becomes, is, is, is a reference to a historical figure that becomes a picture of Antichrist. It says, And it cast down some host of the stars of heaven, stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, it's referring to Antichrist there, but it says that little horn that came out of the four notable ones, all right? Let me explain everything. You say, well, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, drop down, if you would, to verse 20. It says, And the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of the Media and Persia. So we know it's the Medes and the Persians. It's their kingdom. We go back to that idol or that image that Daniel saw, verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. You know who the rough goat was? It was Alexander the Great. Because Alexander the Great is the one that subdued, or if you would, overthrew the Medes and the Persians. His uh, battle with Darius, Darius could not, King Darius could not withstand it, and therefore he became ruler of the known world. Now, if that be the case, look, if you would, in verse, um, verse 8. Therefore, the goat, the, the he goat, waxed very great. He without question did. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Alexander died in 323 AD in his 30s because he lived a debaucherous life, uh, lived a drunken life of excess, and ended up dying from it. Matter of fact, they say he died in a drunken stupor. Now, please do not go, if you would, to all of the secular history books, to, especially the new ones, uh, to validate that. Because man has a way of spinning all their heroes. Amen, amen. He was, a, he was a wicked, debaucherous man. He was angry. He was raised by a stepfather he didn't like. And, uh, uh, or, yeah, a stepfather he didn't like. It was a, it, there was intermarriage, inter marriage, family marrying, really nasty stuff. 
And, uh, but he had a desire and a fervor for domination. When he came to military, he was, a, he was a genius. I'll give you that. But he was still a wicked man. Now, when he died, four of his generals, they had generals, obviously, four of them. Actually, I want to say six, but it, the four basically took over his kingdom. Now, when I say they took it over, like I said, they didn't draw straws or roll the dice for it. I'll take this, I'll take that. Four of them took sections. I think I told you Lysimachus was over in the, looking at a map in the west side. Um, uh, Archelaus, uh, was that it? Not Archelaus. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that wrong. Um, can't remember the name. He's the north. General, 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 general. I can't remember the name. He's in the north, became king of the north. Ptolemy is the most famous. He was in the south. He took uh, England, there was, or not England, um, Egypt, and there was another one to the, um, to the east. The west and the east basically succumbed to the king of the north and the king of the south. Out of those, actually out of the king of the north, came a, uh, came a ruler named Epiphanes. If you've never studied Epiphanes, you need to study him because he, he is the little horn in history. Certainly not the little horn in future, but he's the little horn in history. Um, uh, during the time of um, Epiphanes, actually before that time, there was a... Actually, no, I'm sorry. Epiphanes started it. You've heard of the Maccabees. Well, the Maccabees, you know, I know it's a, I know it's a couple of books out of the... Um, um, what do they call that? Out of the Apocrypha. It's a couple of books out of the Apocrypha. It's just the history of the Maccabees. The Maccabean revolt was a Jewish revolt. It began with Epiphanes. Epiphanes came down, and the stories vary, but basically had a pig slaughtered upon the altar, thus rendering it defiled. Now, some say that, uh, that a, a soldier of his was killed, but there was a man named Judas Maccabees, and he is the founder of the Maccabean Revolt. And, of course, the Maccabean Revolt was, let's throw off this ruler from us, and thus there was the assault on the Maccabees. Um, that as, as the northern king, as the king of the north began to succumb to the ever-growing Roman Empire, which would be the next empire in history, uh, ultimately peace, or, or Israel found peace, the Jew found peace under the hand of Rome. And they did. They found peace. It wasn't always, you say, how do we know that? Because in the Gospels, when Jesus... Um, when he resurrects Lazarus, they go to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees said this, what shall we say for a notable miracle hath been done? And if we leave him alone, all men will believe upon him, and Caesar will come and take away our place. They liked the political... All Caesar was interested in is keeping peace. That was it. They just didn't want the... Ra the, 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 the um, uh, riots or the raising up. They just wanted to make peace, sometimes at any cost. You remember over in the Gospels, uh, or over in uh, Paul, he was at uh, Ephesus. And there was the big uproar at Ephesus over the goddess Diana. And they go into the theater and they're uproaring. And, and one of the uh, rulers of the uh, city stands up and said, look, these men done nothing wrong. And he says, and we now have an assembly that isn't authorized and Caesar's going to come and check this out. Let's disperse now. So it wasn't that they didn't have regulations and rules, but basically, as long as they behaved themselves, they had run within their country. So what you've got here is you've got a story from our perspective, historical, from Daniel's perspective in the Medes and the Persian Empire future, and this is what the Bible tells us about um, the, um, the time of the Grecians, if you would. The, we end with the uh, Medes and the Persians, historically. This is all we get in a prophetical sense. And then we show up in Matthew, and who's running the world? Rome. So if there's one kingdom that the Bible tells us very little about, it is the Grecian Empire. If you want to know more about it, there's a great book called uh, The Kingdom of Brass. It's an old book. I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. I've got it, the name of the guy that wrote it. But it is, it's, it's considered to be the standard as far as the history of the uh, Grecian Empire. But it wouldn't serve you bad, it wouldn't be bad for you to go ahead and read that to give you a little bit of an update. But we know what happens. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, or, um, uh, Alexander the Great takes over and destroys the Medes and the Persians. He rules for a time. He dies. 
His four generals take over. Two of them become prominent, and they battle each other back and forth until such a time as Rome takes over that region of the world. Now, with that being said, once again, there's no question about who these people are. The Bible says it in its place. Um, chapter 9 is probably the most famous of the chapters in the book of Daniel, for it's in chapter 9, if you'll go over to uh, verse 24, it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The most holy being Jesus Christ, okay? Now there's 70 weeks. You've heard of Daniel's 70 weeks. We're not going to spend time on this a lot, but basically what he's saying is, there's this many weeks that the temple is being rebuilt. That is Ezra. That's building the, te the, the temple under Ezra and they're under Zerubbabel, what's known as Zerubbabel's temple. And uh, he says there's this many weeks. Now, keep in mind, the weeks here prophetically are what they know as weeks of years. Each day is a year. All right? Why is that? A, uh, wh how can that be? Well, the first time that God, the first time that God judged his people and kept them out of the land, guess what he gave them? He gave him a year for a day. Remember over there in the book of Numbers? He said, fine. He said, you'll bear your burden for, uh, for every day that you surveyed the land. He said, you're going to get a year. And it ended up being 40 years. You remember that. Now, here, he says it's 70 weeks, but it's weeks of years. And it works out perfectly. We're not going to try to go through it. I welcome you to do so. But there's so much time that the temple's being rebuilt. And then from that time to Messiah is so many weeks. <laughs> the one thing that Daniel doesn't do, though, is he doesn't address the 70th week. That becomes the key of all prophecy you've ever listened to. That becomes the key of Larkin's charts and any chart you've ever looked at. The 70th week of Daniel. Okay, if it's a week, the 70th week, then how many years are in that week? The seven. Thus you have the Great Tribulation. And that's how it rolls. And so when you're talking about Daniel's 70th week, you're really talking about the Great Tribulation. Now he seals up the book in the book of Daniel. Daniel gets this revelation. And if you'll go on over, go on over to chapter 12. We'll just go there. Go on over to chapter 12. Or back up if you would. To, I'll give you that in a second. But go to chapter 11, midpoint. I'm just going to, um, how many know who Josephus is? Josephus was a Jew. He was a historian. If you don't have his works, they're easily to get. We've got them in the bookstore. Basically, he's just writing the history. As a matter of fact, people say, well, they were not even sure Jesus Christ existed. There's historical evidence for Jesus Christ being on this earth, not just the Bible. Uh, Josephus is one of them. He spoke of him in virtu almost virtually a contemporary with him, and he writes him. All right? And uh, you say, well, that's just one. Yeah, that's laughable. You know, when it comes to the Bible issue, there's over 5,000 Greek manuscripts. Over 5,000 they have. You know what a manuscript is, right? Manuscript is a handwritten copy. Handwritten copy. There's over 5,000 of them in existence. The majority texts agree with one another, like in the like high 90%, 98%, 98.9%. There's an agreeance with it. Almost virtually all in agreeance. Not the minority text, right? Um, Plato. Do you know how many writings of Plato we have? None. Plato never wrote a book. All we have of Plato is his oral words, as was given to us by Socrates. And there's only about 250 of those, and the closest one is 900 years after Socrates. But no one questions what Plato said. <laughs> You're going to have to come to the grips that, listen, the issue is not the evidence. The issue is bias. And this world is biased against that book. They're biased against the God of that book. And they'll make every single argument they can and then change the argument when it comes to their gods. And that's what they do. And that's the reason why you really should know some of those things. You ought to be able to, when someone says, well, there's 5,000. Yeah, but they're so old. And just throw, well, how, how many writings of Plato you think there are? Do you think he existed? Do you believe he exists? You get the idea, right? You should, and by the way, 
there's much more than that point. But the idea is, is you ought to have, and I say that for this reason. Uh, you, we're not going to read them. I'm just going to read uh, uh, verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. I'm not going to go into its conflict between the kings. But that, uh, that story right there, chapter two, uh, verse 23, that is in Josephus. I've got the, the, the page and the paragraph. Go down to 25. That is in Josephus. I've got the page and the paragraph. 28. That is in Josephus' history. I've got the page and the paragraph. Uh, 30 is. 31 is. 33 is. You see what he's saying? That's historical evidence. Well, preacher, I believe the Bible. I don't need historical evidence. But you might be, it might be good for you to have some simply to shut the mouth of the guy who doesn't believe the Bible. Amen. And so, I think that's interesting. And it's interesting in this case, because with Josephus, you've got him starting at creation, making his way through. Obviously, he wasn't in creation, uh, but he gives writings. He goes back to some of the older historical writers, so on, so on. Um, and he makes his way up through Jesus Christ, up into the, um, uh, the wars of antiquity, the wars of the Jews. It would be good for you to read them, because in Daniel especially, they become quite relevant, if you would. Not necessarily, you're not backing the Bible and say, well, I know it's true because in Josephus. That's my big issue with uh, Christian archaeology. I'm not against them digging bones up. I'm not against them big, digging manuscripts up. But there's nothing you can dig up that's going to validate this book. Because as soon as you dig something up to validate this book, you just place an authority over it. I know it's true because they found these. I remember years ago, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a fraud, but you know how many Christians, you know how many Christians jump onto stupid stuff? Now, I'm not kidding, I'm serious. They put, they put frivolous emails out with the hopes that Christians will jump onto it. The government is getting ready to, uh, to eliminate all religious liberty, and all of a sudden, Facebook, Twitter, everything, Christians, how dare them do this? And they sit back and laugh at us because we're fools. Amen. A fool believes a matter before he hears it. It's the honor of kings to diligently search out a matter. I, uh, around the area, I used to have some people that would send me, uh, preachers, matter of fact, send me uh, this article. And I'm thinking, what? You ever read something? I mean, even for the world we live in, it's kind of like, what? Right? And so I did some research on it. And I would find out it wasn't true. And so I would send the evidence that wasn't true and say, hey, listen, you need to quit this because this isn't real. It's just, it's just a joke. It's just stupid. All right? And you say, what they do? They quit sending them to me. <laughs> because God forbid they should quit circulating the junk, right? Amen? So, uh, but with, Joseph, with Josephus, you have history, and it wouldn't be bad for you to maybe know some of that stuff. Uh, but, go, but in Daniel chapter 12, go over there. And after this, after going through the last days, oh, I got to say this too. Listen, Daniel in no way has anything to do with the church age or the church. Go back, if you would, to Daniel's 70th week. Daniel, 70th week. Go back. That's in chapter 9. How many believe in a literal interpretation of Scripture? You read it like it is. Amen? Look in chapter uh, 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon, say it. Well, those two words say it. Thy people and upon thy city. Okay, so tell me something. Who's the thy people there? Who's Daniel's people? The 70th week is called in Jeremiah, it's called the time of Jacob, I believe it's Jeremiah, the time of Jacob's trouble. Listen, that has nothing to do. Now there's practical application. For instance, go in chapter 12 and go down to, if you would, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And what that's been used time and again for is uh, soul winning. I'm not against using it as an application, a spiritual application, but doctrinally that has nothing to do with us. He's talking about a Jewish resurrection. Well, if that has something to do with us, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, look in verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to everlasting or to shame and everlasting contempt. 
All right? Are we going to take verse 3 and say that's us and not take verse 2 and say that is too? Neither of them are, but they both have application. Listen, my shame and your shame that you're going to bear at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a thousand years. What do you mean shame? I mean, you know, once again, it's like that guy over there, he, you know, the Lord gave, the master gave them all a pound each. He said, go out. He said, I'll come back. And he comes back and he pulls that guy in with a pound, that first guy, and says, how much, how, what'd you do with it? He said, I turned it into 10. He said, well, rule over 10 cities. That next guy, he said, what'd you do with it? He said, I turned it into five. He said, great, rule over five cities. He goes out one. He said, what'd you do with it? He said, well, I knew you were hard and a man, you, you uh, sowed where we reap not, you know, and so I was nervous and scared. And so I just hid it in a napkin. Here it is. And he said, you wicked servant, right? Bible says, Paul told Timothy, he said, we, we, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. That's 2 Timothy. Don't get rid of that if. I believe with all my heart that at the, at the, uh, the, the millennium, I mean, we're all going to be, be there because of Jesus Christ. Say amen right there, all right? I'm going to be there, but I believe with all my heart in the millennium, there'll be Christians that will be ruling, and there will be some that don't get to rule. And what Jesus Christ says is this. He said, hey, saint, he said, you give me 70 years down there. He said, I'll give you a thousand of glory. You take your glory in 70. He said, you can bear it for a thousand. Amen. And so I understand that, but that's not eternal. This is eternally said. Everlasting. Everlasting shame. Everlasting contempt. What are you saying? I'm saying that Daniel's not about the church. It's not about the church age. He says, it's thy people. And that's a big deal today, folks, because today we've got increasingly numbers of people that are abandoning. And the fact is, they have a right to if they want to. I'm not going to say they're wicked people or terrible people. I think they're misguided and misled. But there is a movement today where everybody's going to, the church is going through the tribulation. The church is going through the tribulation. I don't believe it's going through the tribulation. And they do it now by saying, well, not all the tribulation is wrath. What book are you reading? I don't know, in Revelation, I didn't find one chapter in Revelation I wanted to live through. What about you? They say, well, it's not wrath. It's just kind of natural consequences until those vials poured out. And when the vials are poured out, that's the wrath of God. Natural consequences. When's the last time you saw the earth open up and weird looking hybrid locusts come out of smoke? that have a scorpion tail and a lion's head. Where'd you see that? That's supernatural. You know what the tribulation is? It's supernatural. And we've got a world that's getting ready for it right now. Amen. I remember Doc Ruckman saying this. He said, we've got the, this is the generation. We've got the generation. And we do. Today, if you had... Uh, I, how many, please, don't, if, you, if you said this, don't even look like you did, Okay. But several years ago, there was the movie came out, E.T., and they went, oh, how cute. He was weird looking. I would run from him in the daytime. That's not cute, but all we're looking for, that's it, man, you know, there's got to be some life out there. Yeah, there's some life out there. You don't want to meet it. It's not a question of whether UFOs. Boy, I'm out there now, aren't I? No, there's no question about that. That's not, the question is, who are they? That's the issue. And I'll tell you who they are. They're angelic, demonic beings who have the capability and still have the capability to step out of the spiritual realm and step, step into the physical realm. They did it throughout Bible. Didn't he say over here, he said, be careful. He said, you might be entertaining angels unawares. We forget that. Amen. Well, well, this is the church age. Everything doesn't wipe out in the church age. Amen. That's who they are. You don't want to meet them. You know, about every four years, at least every four years, there's a UFO flap that takes place. And you realize that the people that have documented this stuff, they're not Roonies. They're, they're, they're not the guy down the street that just downed the fifth and is staring up at the sky. That's not it. These people are colonels in the Air Force, and they had visual sight of these things. I say that because that's another thing, too. Uh, let me just go run this rabbit and shoot it, too, okay? One thing that really bothers me, listen, I don't embrace everything that Dr. Ruckman says. Now, I'm not going to argue with him. Obviously, he's in heaven now, all right? I'm not going to argue with him. But on the same account, I'm not going to buy something just because he says it. I'm just not going to jump on, on the bandwagon. 
But that being said, there's people who say, well, you know, he believes in UFOs. He's got a tape series on UFOs. Ah, oh, give it a rest. Give it a rest. At least he looked into it. I'm sorry, have I made everybody mad now? <laughs> Amen. I saw one. Now, you're going to leave the church now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. I saw one several years ago. I don't know if mom remembers it or not. She might not remember it. But uh, I saw one out our back window. We lived in Reading. I got home late at night, looked back. I was getting a drink of water, looked at it. And it was like cigar shaped. They always are. It had the lights going around it like that. And it was just hovering. And I'm looking at it like that. And I go in, I got her up. I, I said, come here, look at this. And she got up and she walked in. And she looked at it and said, what is that? She looked at it and she said, that looks like a UFO. And she went back to bed. <laughs> I watched her for about another five minutes myself and I went to bed. And neither of us were taken. I don't know about her. I know I wasn't. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. See, this world, what we do is we sit back and we scoff at this stuff. But in the Bible, you've got, there's such stuff in the Bible. You're sitting back and scratching your head and saying, man, and it's high time we start believing what the book says, no matter how it fits into modern day understanding. I remember... I remember 20 years ago, I remember when it changed. I remember 20 years ago at least, 20, 25 years ago. And people that believed the book knew that Genesis 6 wasn't the sons of, the, of the sons of Seth. They knew it was angelic beings that left their first estate and cohabitated with man and produced creatures, giants, men of renown. They knew that because what the Bible said. There's no question about it. You have to define what a son of God is. And once you define that, you're saying there's no question about it. All the fundamentalists, all of them, that was a heretical doctrine. All of them. Until, and I remember sitting there in a pastor's fellowship, when a very, very famous preacher from down in North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina, got up and said, listen, we have been, and he was a fundamentalist, we have been scoffing at this idea for years. He said, but we never dreamed they would clone an animal like Dolly. He said, and you know, by the time he was done saying, this has caused me to step back. So let me get this straight then. It wasn't you didn't know what the Bible says. You just couldn't believe what it says because it was outside the realm of what you thought was possible. Can I tell you what's possible? In Genesis 11, the Lord came down and said, man has become one. And now nothing will be restrained from him of that which he imagineth to do. Have you ever said, they'll never do that? They'll never do that. You say, are you saying they can do anything? No, I'm saying that we have limited that statement from God. I'll tell you this, right now, there's some weird stuff going on right now. They've got the place now where they can put an artificial limb on you and they can attach the, the nerves to where your nerves are moving that artificial limb. We never thought they'd do that. We never thought it. We never thought they'd take a heart and put another heart or somebody else in someone, a lung. They had a face transplant now, which, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That would just be, I, I would be very choosy. <laughs> I want that face, that's what I want. <laughs> I don't want the, the, the cleft in right here, I don't want that, yeah. I'm sorry, I digress. All right, enough with Daniel. Are we all right? That's Daniel, all right? Um, seven, we seven weeks, they're building the temple. Uh, the command to restore and build Jerusalem, 62 weeks, 434 years. Then Messiah's cut off, the Bible says. So you got 69 years that were given, but were never given that 70th year. All right, Hosea. Hosea is a rebuke of Israel. Hosea, the, here, here's where it begins. I want you to go to Hosea chapter... Um, 1 verse 2, in the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said, unto, said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. All right? Well, it starts off with a flying, you know, wave of, oh, God would never tell someone to do that. And people normally do that. That's what they'll do. Many commentators, well, obviously God wouldn't tell Hosea. So this is a parable. It's not a parable. It's history. God told the guy to go take a wife of whoredoms. Go find this woman of ill repute. Go find this prostitute. Marry her. They have a child, and then she goes off to back to her business. That's her nature. And the whole idea is this. The whole idea is, 
you go through the book of Joel and he says now tell them that I'm you and they're that woman the command is to Israel the book is to Israel but how many would agree spiritually speaking it could speak to a Christian amen you ever gone out on the Lord you ever go after something else other than the Lord Amen. That's the spiritual application. But the doctrine of it is this. Listen, God told the prophets, I thank God I'm not a prophet. Man, he told one of them, he said, run around naked. I know, no, he had a loincloth. He wasn't really naked. I know that. We're always trying to redefine it to our understanding because God would never make someone do that. Uh, remember the story over in the book of Judges. It was Jephthah. And Jephthah went out and brought a great victory for Israel. But when he went out, he said, Lord, if you'll go with me and you'll deliver these people to me and deliver Israel, he said, I'll sacrifice to you as a burnt offering the first thing that comes out my door. Guess what the first thing was? His daughter. His daughter. And so he said, well, you've made me very sad, my daughter. And she said, well, if you've, if you've said something to the Lord, he she said, go ahead and do it. Just let me go three months and bemoan, be, uh, bemoan my uh, vir virginity. And so she wanders around for being, uh, three months uh, lamenting, comes back, and he takes her and he sacrifices her to God as a burnt offering. Now understand this, he didn't have to do that. There is such a thing as a frivolous vow, and he could have brought a sin offering. But in the book of Judges, I'm sure they didn't know the book very well and didn't know the law very well. Because every man did that was right in his own eyes. All right, So he didn't have to do it. But to de this day, you know what people say? Well, are you, do you, I had a guy look at me once. He said, do you really think that he did that? I said, God said he did. But it was so far outside the realm of their, I can't even imagine, I can't believe that. You better watch that reading this book. You better watch that. For years, for years, uh, Saul goes to, uh, they, they've taught this, for Saul, Saul goes to the witch of Endor. And he says, uh, call me up Samuel. And it works. And so, but God would never use a witch. See how we, God would never do this. God would never do that. You're getting ready for landmines. You're going to trip over some stuff. And someone said, well, you really think that God let him bring up Samuel? Said he did. Yeah, but it was a witch. Okay, I guess God can use witches if he wants. And he said, well, yeah, but I just think it might have been, you know, an unclean spirit. And I forget who it was that was talking to me and uh, or preaching and they said it and I just started laughing I, out loud because I thought it was so funny he said um, he had a guy asking me he said you really think that was Sam he said well it, yeah it was two guys two guys there's two preachers talking together on a podcast and they got into that and one of them said do you really think that do you really think that that was uh, that was Samuel and the other one said well it says and Samuel said that pretty that ties a bow on it doesn't it Samuel said Listen, when you read this book, would you please, God, help me not to go to my own understanding. My own understanding. That's our problem. Amen. And as far out as it may sound, as far as it may be, sit back and say, God, help me accept what you say no matter what. That's the whole book of Hosea. You can read it now. And I'm not going to go through all that. Maybe we'll go through it sometimes. We, we, we did way back. But the fact is, is when you go through it, sometimes, once again, he goes back to events that are going on when, when uh, Hosea is uh, writing it. Sometimes he goes prophetical. That's just the nature of a prophet. But he's taking a situation. He's just like Ezekiel. Ezekiel did the same. He said, Ezekiel, he said, I want you to become a, 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 a sign for me. One of the hardest ones is he says, I'm going to take your, your beloved by a stroke. His wife. He said, I don't want you to put on sackcloth. I don't want you to shed a tear. I don't want you to look sad. That'd be a tough thing. God, why? You're going to be a sign for me. And when they look at you and they're saying, what's wrong? Why aren't you sorrowing? You tell them, you're me and your wife was them. Amen. I think, still, I, I th I think God still gives visual aids. Man, you something in life, and you're going, uh, like that. Amen, amen. So you got Hosea, and Hosea is what, 12 chapters? Is that right? 12 chapters, 13 chapters. And that's what that's about. We're going to finish the book of Joel. The book of Joel is one of the finest books in the Bible. Actually, the man that I was, or the book that I was uh, named after, Joel, the theme of Joel is the day of the Lord. 
It's all about the day of judgment. Once again, the day of the Lord runs anywhere from just before the great tribulation second coming all the way into the millennial kingdom. That's the day of the Lord. That phrase is used on things that are, that are happening in the millennium. That phrase is used on things that are happening in the great tribulation period. And that, but if you want to know really classically that phrase is dealt with more than any other time, it deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The day of judgment, day of the Lord. So it's a negative book. So if you think I'm negative, now you know where I got it. Amen. And uh, he starts out in chapter 1 with the rebuke of Israel once again. When he says in chapter 5, Awake ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, uh, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. He's cutting it off because of verse 4. There's a palmer worm, there's a locust, there's a canker worm, there's a caterpillar. That's, hey, that's destruction, folks. I'm telling you what. To, we had uh, a few years ago, there's a teeny little bug. It was called an um, emerald ash borer. And it absolutely killed all the ash trees. I had about three or four of them, or about three of them in my yard it killed off. Now that's, I, you know, you say, well, it's just a tree. What happens when he sends something that kills the tomato plants, strawberry plants? They say there's one out there called the, um, what was it, the horned, um, something, horned beetle. I forget the, but it kills a bunch of different kinds of trees. You realize, they said it would decimate the maple trees. Do you realize what this landscape would look like if the maple trees were gone? The maple, tree, maple trees are like the most abundant tree in our area. Now that boar came in, Little teeny thing about that big. And it had the stamp of God all over it. This, is the, I, this was the most amazing thing to me, and it's true. If you, what it would do is it bore in, this is how it killed it, it bore into the, um, to the bark, and then it would begin to work its way up the, the flesh of the tree, but it would zigzag back and forth like this, killing a wide swath of that tree. That's how, and multiple boars would get in. Basically, they would have done what we would call bark the tree. You know, if you take, take the bark off all the way around the tree, even this big, you've barked the tree, that tree's going to die. Can't survive. And what they would do is from the inside, they would bark the tree. But that hole that they would burrow in, that was the most amazing thing to me. You know what it is? It's a perfect capital, capital D. Perfect. It goes like this, and it has a straight line that comes down. Just like a D. Now you tell me where I think figure that out. Wouldn't you think it'd be a whole lot easier just to make a round hole? Perfect capital D. Now I'm not saying, you say God brought that on? Maybe, I don't know. But I know this. I can't imagine. An L Here, here's a, here's a, bur a, a bore. Uh, what am I going to, I know what I'll do. I'll just make a flat side on one side and make a, a moon shape on the other side. No, I think that's God. And I watched those things die off. I remember the, the Buckeye trees several years ago, the Buckeyes were hit. Now, folks, listen. We have weird weather this, this spring. You know, they're talking about, and everything's global warming and everything's climate change and blah, 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 blah. And nothing is God saying, would you please wake up? This year, there have been there have been crops been hit. You say, why? Because there was late frost. It's cool still. It's odd. It's cool. I think God does that stuff. I think God, about the time all the blooms get out, happened to the, uh, happened to the, um, oh, what's the big, the, it's beautiful. Er, one of the earliest blooming trees around here. What's, what's it? Magnolia. Happened to the magnolias this year. They, bloom, they were getting ready to bloom out, and here come this freeze, and when the freeze came, you just have these beautiful blooms surrounding these dead brown buds. You say, why? I don't know, but I know this. I know that God, all God's got to do is bring a storm. You know, he did the latter rains, the latter rains. He would bring rain sometimes when it was ready to reap the harvest of the wheat. You know what happened when you'd have a rain when you're ready to reap the, a driving rain? You know what happened? It would decimate the wheat crop. Amen. You know what he's talking to Joel about? He said, tell them. He said, this is the way it's going to be. Now, we'll pick up next week about that. There's a couple of more chapters, but he moves in. He goes from what's going on there all the way to what we know as the judgment of the nations, Matthew 25. We'll look at that next week. Let's pray and say hello to people coming in. Lord, I pray, Father, you'd bless the morning service. Thank you for 
our mothers. And Lord, I pray, Father, they have a wonderful day today and we honor them, as you said, give honor to whom honors do, and it certainly is due. And I pray, Father, most of all, that Jesus Christ might be glorified, your word might go forth to the hearts of saints, and we might be challenged by your word. Change us, Lord, I pray. Lord, there's other things that we pray about that we just don't say anything about. We ask you, and we plead to you to work in those situations. And we'll thank you for what you do, Father, in Jesus.